Now the same process we just talked about for the hydration of carbonyls can also occur if instead of using water we have an alcohol. So an alcohol can uh, participate in that exact same process. Okay, so if we take an aldehyde and we have it in the presence of an alcohol, and I will just use methanol uh, just to illustrate uh, in the beginning, um, there can be an equilibrium just like we saw with water where that alcohol can add to the carbonyl okay, and give us this type of, of product. Okay, So instead of uh, geminal diol, now we have um, an, an alcohol and an alkoxy on the same uh, on the same carbon and this is a functional group that's called a hemiacetal okay hemiacetal and incidentally um, if it uh, occurs with a ketone okay, we would get the same type of situation except with instead of having that that proton we have another substituent this is technically called a hemiketal Okay, hemiketal or hemiacetal. Um, chemists oftentimes um, are maybe a little bit sloppy, and, and I, I am as well, um, in calling uh, sometimes both of these acetals or talking about this general process as acetylization, even if it occurs on, on a, even if it occurs on a ketone. Um, uh, Technically, you know, they, they are different things, but they are so similar that um, I think a, a lot of times um, you'll, you'll find me just re describing them both as, as acetals. Um, so uh, just keep that in mind uh, that they, they more or less are the same type of thing. So where are hemiacetals important? Well, uh, first of all, I guess I should say that um, the, this equilibrium, as we saw with um, hydration, tends to favor... Um, the carbonyl, uh, right, and for the exact same reasons that we talked about with the hydrates. Um, there is an exception, uh, which is that if you have a carbonyl um, that is uh, tethered um, to, to the alcohol, right, so in, in this case we can have um, the, the carbonyl attached to the alcohol that's going to form the hemiacetal. Um, this also has an equilibrium um, in which in which on the uh, hemiacetal side we have um, a, a cyclic system, a ring, and if this is going to fi form a five or six membered ring, membered ring, um, this oftentimes will uh, will then uh, favor the closed form. Okay, so in these situations, it's actually going to be favored to to have the ring um, formed as opposed to open. Okay, <clears throat> now. Um, uh, and, and by the way, if you if you have a substituent on your carbonyl that's electron withdrawing, that's also going to favor the hemiacetal formation for the same reason we talked about with the hydrates. So where do we see hemiacetals? Well, far and away, the most important um, area that we see them is actually in sugars. So if we look at something like um, glucose, uh, this is actually uh, an aldehyde that uh, has all of these alcohol substituents and here we go so there's glucose is so one two three four five alcohols and then an aldehyde um, but this doesn't sit around usually in this open form in fact what it'll do is to form um, a cyclic hemiacetal draw all of these hydroxies in here okay and there we go and so this is this is the the common form of glucose um, and we'll actually talk about sugars later in the semester in detail but that uh, most um, or really all sugars um, involve um, this this uh, acetal or hemiacetal formation um, and in, in the case of glucose you form this very stable six membered ring so um, all of the, the sugars um, that you probably learn about in biochemistry or biology uh, have this uh, hemiacetal um, situation going on. And I'll just show you one other one, um, deoxyribose, right? The, the sugar backbone of DNA. Okay. 
right? So that's deoxyribose, and you can see right there, there's the hemiacetal linkage, right? So there's, if you open that up, that would be an aldehyde right there, and then there's the alcohol that would add to that. So um, in, if you look at the structure of DNA, you have the, the phosphates and you have the base pairs, but then you have that sugar backbone, and those sugars uh, basically have this hemiacetal linkage. Okay, so how do hemiacetals form? So this is just extremely similar to the hydration mechanisms we just talked about, um, and they can be catalyzed by base and they can cat be catalyzed by acid. Okay, both of those are still plausible. So very quickly we can walk through these and, and see how this is going to occur. So I'm just going to choose, again, methanol, just so that I'm not drawing a lot of R groups, um, but keep in mind that this could occur with any alcohol. Okay, so in the base uh, regime, right, so this is going to be uh, where we're going to have RO minus, and then it's going to be in the same alcohol, right? So sodium ethoxide in methanol, or potassium ethoxide in ethanol, um, those are always going to match up. So we're always going to have the alkoxide form and then the corresponding um, alcohol to, to serve as a proton source. Okay. So as we talked about in the base regime, we're going to add and protonate, add and protonate. So that's all we're going to do here. We're going to add the alkoxide to the carbonyl. And so push those electrons up. And there's our O minus. Right, so again, we all we did was we exchanged, we exchanged O minus for O minus, and then we're in the last step. We're simply going to grab a proton from some of the methanol that's in the, in the medium, <clears throat> and there is our. In this case, I just drawn a hemiketal, okay, hemiketal, um, because it's from a ketone, but uh, ketal or acetal, so it's all the same, um, and that's how we do the base catalyzed mechanism. Now the reverse, uh, you know, is is hopefully you can you can get to that. I would uh, um, encourage you to see if you can write the reverse mechanism to go from the the hemiketal back to uh, the the ketone starting material. And it should be straightforward, and, and remember that it involves these exact structures, um, and you just need to push the arrows in the opposite way. Okay, the acid catalyzed. Um, Scenario again, it's it's just like we saw with the the hydrates. So we're going to have um, in this case um, some proton source and then also our alcohol of choice. Okay, so this could be uh, in this case methanol with a, a tiny drop of HCl would would do the job. Okay, so remember with the acid catalyzed regime, we're doing PAD, protonate, add, and deprotonate. So <clears throat> we're going to first react the carbonyl with the proton. Yeah. That gets us to our oxocarbenium ion. And again, I'm just going to pick methanol just for simplicity. But uh, at this case, uh, or at this point, the oxocarbenium is highly electrophilic, so it's able to accept methanol as the nucleophile. Okay. And there is our Methanol, so the positive charge is here, and then we're simply going to use some more methanol to do our final deprotonation. Protonate, add, deprotonate, and that gets us to our hemiketal in the same way, okay? So look at these mechanisms, compare them to the hydrate uh, mechanisms, and hopefully you'll see that they're really uh, identical, um, except the only difference is that instead of having HOH, we have ROH, okay? So acetals, hemiacetals, um, both both work. Now, in the case of the, of the base, the case of the base catalyzed uh, um, formation, this is as far as we can go. The base can form this, but then the only thing a base can do to this molecule is to actually pull off that proton and make it go backwards. And so this is certainly certainly reversible. I should draw my equilibrium arrows for all of these. Okay, so the base cat catalyzed mechanism has to stop at the hemiketal or the hemiacetal. The acid mechanism can actually keep going. It can actually keep doing this process um, to do something that's also extremely important and useful, which is to go on to form acetals. So this is a hemiacetal. We can keep going and form an acetal. 
hemiacetal to acetal, all right? So in this case, right, think about the reverse mechanism, right? What we would do is we would protonate this methoxide to get to here, the, the, the methoxy substituent to get to here, and then these electrons would kick down and eject the methanol, and then you'd deprotonate. But imagine we did that reverse mechanism, except that we did it on the hydroxyl group. If we protonate here and have the methoxy kick in and spit out water, then we'd get to an oxycarbenium, which another methanol molecule could add. Okay, so you can see in the acid regime, we can actually substitute both hydroxies, uh, or, or both, we can get two uh, um, alkoxy substituents um, in there. Okay, so let's talk about that. This is going to be the formation of an acetal. Okay, so I'm going to start from this intermediate here. I can just label it as A. Right? <clears throat> so we're going to start from having already formed our at, uh, hemi, hemi ketal um, intermediate. Okay, so that's A. All right, so we're still in acid. Okay, and so what we're going to do is rather than protonate the methoxy to go backwards, we're going to protonate the hydroxy. Okay. okay, so now this is positively charged, and now we're going to utilize the lone pairs from this methoxy, so that's going to kick in and then spit out the OH2, okay? Now at this point, so I'm going to, I'm just going to flip this up, All right, so I draw it in a normal way. There we go. All right, so now we've got to an oxycarbenium ion. This is, this is directly analogous to this oxycarbenium ion where we had a proton. It's just that in this case, it's now an alkyl substituent, but it's the same type of thing and it's, and it's equally reactive, okay? So now at this point, uh, we basically just did the reverse of this thing to get to here, but now we're gonna go back forward. We're gonna go back forward, but instead of with water, we're going to do methanol. Okay, so now methanol is going to add to this oxocarbenium ion. Okay, and that's going to give us this intermediate. We've got our positive charge here. And then the final thing we're going to do is simply deprotonate. All right, so just like we did in the hemi ketal formation. And then that's going to get us to the, our final our final product and there we go and so this is so this one's technically a ketal and if I had done this on a uh, aldehyde where I would have a, a hydrogen here this would be called an acetal okay so hemiacetal, acetal, hemiketal, ketal, okay? So there's a lot that, that appears to be going on here, um, but uh, I would like to stress that it's, it's sort of the same thing that's just happening twice, okay? So you're, you're activating your carbonyl. Let me bring this back down. You're, you're activating your carbonyl, adding one alcohol, um, neutralizing, and then you're basically activating now the hydroxy, getting it to leave, and then adding a second, okay? So all of those steps are sort of all the same and they just keep happening uh, more or less in the same way. Okay, so why do we care about acetals? Well, it turns out that um, in terms of stability, acetals are, are actually quite stable. So it's sort of akin to, um, the, when we talked about ethers, and we talked, we said that ethers don't undergo a lot of chemistry, um, which potentially makes them into reasonable protecting groups for an alcohol. Um, but the problem is that ethers are really hard to cleave, as we've learned. Um, acetals are are also stable because they no longer have these OH functionalities that um, can can do uh, deprotonation or things like that. Um, and so uh, acetals. Are, are basically uh, protecting groups for carbonyls. OK, 
Okay. Um, and I, in the next video, we'll, we'll just go through uh, that issue of using an acetal as a protecting group um, in a little bit more detail.